Welcome everyone to um, today's webinar on uh, behavioral communication strategies for uh, COVID-19. Um, I'm so happy that all of you have been able to make it. As I see here, we uh, are numbering around uh, 68, 69, 70 and counting. Um, so that is quite encouraging. Um, we also have quite a panel uh, before us <clears throat> that will be taking us through uh, today's uh, discussions and um, the panel includes um, starting from uh, uh, is it left to right on your screen if you can see the same screen as I am seeing um, the person uh, on the extreme left is myself Ben Goye from uh, Strathmore Business School uh, then immediately next to me you have the profile picture of uh, uh, Professor Steve Samud from uh, Wharton Business School. And then immediately after that, you have Dr. Chris Dickey from NYU. And uh, at the extreme right, we have Dr. Pratap Kumar, who's also with me at the Strathmore Business School. Now, we do hope that we will be able to take just about an hour. And what we want to achieve in today's discussion is pretty much to focus um, on, on communication strategies. Um, but in order for us to do that, I think it is useful to set a little bit of a context. Um, we hear many things. We've seen all the memes on uh, TV for some of us asking the public as to whether they can, uh, which one they think is worse between coronavirus and COVID. So there's a lot of uh, still uh, uh, misconception or misunderstanding regarding what is what. So COVID is a disease, um, coronavirus, uh, NCOV-19 or SARS-CoV-2 um, is the virus that causes it. The name corona uh, was actually given to this batch of viruses uh, just in the late 60s uh, based on their appearance on electron microscopy, which is what gave them this hello. So, that is the reason why even on the image that we have there, uh, those red things that seem to be projecting out appear as a halo on uh, electron microscopy. They are not new. They are quite widespread. Uh, they occur in quite a range of mammals. And in fact, this particular one has a lot of similarity to uh, uh, the previous uh, SARS virus um, that came up, I think must have been around uh, 2002 thereabouts from China and the same with the, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus that came up around 10 years later, about 2012, if I'm not mistaken, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so the thing is, they are restricted to the respiratory tract and to the uh, intestinal tract, although most of the, the uh, infection appears to happen in the respiratory tract. And that is why uh, the symptoms are pretty much those of, uh, of a common cold or flu, uh, uh, as you will. It is seasonal and uh, comes, you know, um, in, the, in the cold seasons, more or less. Uh, the virus is airborne, uh, which I think all of us must have summarized uh, by now. Um, because of the conversation that has recently been coming and the clamor for, 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 for for vaccine, I think it is uh, fair to say that immune responses actually do develop, but they don't last very long for these viruses. So infections can occur in as little as give or take, four months more or less, okay? Uh, what is Kenya's situation as regards this, uh, uh, this uh, pandemic, okay? The word pandemic, by the way, does not mean that it is more severe than an epidemic. What a pandemic simply means is that it, it, it has crossed boundaries. The outbreak of disease has crossed several boundaries. And that is why it is given uh, uh, that designation, all right? Now, in Kenya, as at uh, yesterday, um, um, we were talking, no, as at this morning, we were talking of uh, 582 confirmed cases, um, 190 recoveries and 26 deaths. Uh, but globally, we are talking of about 3.6 million plus uh, of confirmed cases with about 251 deaths. Um, of the confirmed cases, uh, just under half of them have been confirmed as having recovered. Now, 
with that context, um, we need to, uh, I would like us then to start sort of uh, sharing a little bit so that you just don't hear from me. Um, in terms of um, the responses that have uh, been put in place, um, both from the level of government uh, and from the level of, uh, you know, communities and other players in this space, uh, with regards to, 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 to trying to mitigate or manage the, <clears throat> uh, the effect of the, of the virus. And so I will turn to my panel, therefore, uh, to get us kicking. Now, what I want to ask from you, the participants, is this, because we are very many uh, participating in the, in the call. If you could quickly write your questions on the chat at the bottom there, uh, that way I'll be able to see and read them and then present them uh, to the participants, okay? So please take advantage of the chat uh, icon at the bottom there to write out your question. A good question, as I normally tell my students, starts with a capital letter, ends with a question mark, and the distance between the two is quite short. So the more specific your question is, the easier it will be for us to be able to, to respond to it, okay? So... Let me start then by um, uh, turning to my panel, and maybe it might make sense to, to hear the, the, the American story first. And I turn to Chris. Um, what are some of the, the, the uh, uh, public health or health promotion strategies that uh, uh, have been put in place in, uh, in the US with regards to, to this pandemic? Well, thank you. First, thank you very much for inviting me to join this panel, and I'm excited to to uh, to hear my co-panelists' thoughts on on our conversation today. And I'm quite honored to be invited to join Strathmore University's webinar series. So, thank you, Ben, for this invitation. Uh, in the United States and in New York, in particular. Uh, it's been a fairly remarkable response. Uh, speaking as somebody who's been not only a public health professional for a long time, but a New Yorker for quite a long time, I've never seen uh, as rapid a behavior change. And I didn't expect as rapid a behavior change uh, among New Yorkers particularly as we've seen in the last two, three months. Um, as you know, the response from our federal government has been fractured and confusing and bewildering and infuriating at some times. And in fact, it's probably resulted in a, in, in a more severe epidemic in the United States than in other countries um, because of this lack of federal leadership. But because the U.S. is is, uh, is structured in a way that the governors of the states have enormous power, and enormous influence, uh, our governors have taken on the role of, of really um, becoming the leaders in, in the public health response. And so in particular, the governors of New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Connecticut have, have really come together to make sure that the response from the leadership, from the political leadership has been clear and consistent. And I think that's helped us uh, at least as citizens um, trust that our behavior change is, is having an effect and is doing it is, is for the right reasons. So if you'd have told me six months ago that New Yorkers would be willing, first of all, to sit in their homes for two, three months, to wipe down their, their groceries, to homeschool their children, to not go to work, to not get on the subways, to not uh, engage in what really makes us all New Yorkers, I would have thought that was a bit of a far-fetched idea, but in fact, that's what's happened. And in fact, for the last two months, our, the strategy here of, of staying at home, of distancing, now wearing masks, uh, has had a dramatic effect on the epidemiology curve in this region. The rest of the United States is not. If you watch, if you look at the statistics for the rest of the US, where the messaging has been a bit more fractured, uh, people are, one, still going out, they're still mixing with one another in much too close of a proximity, they're probably not wearing masks, and in fact, in some cases, wearing masks is a controversial statement, which, as a public health person, is bewildering, but uh, it has been quite, quite remarkable uh, in the U.S., uh, despite the fact that our 
the, the, the epidemic here has been incredibly severe and we've been very, very hard hit in this region uh, by the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for, sharing, uh, for sharing that, uh, Chris. Um, in the Kenyan context is also, uh, you know, uh, we've seen some interesting uh, moves in terms of uh, uh, strategies that have been put in place um, to address the pandemic, um, you know, ranging from um, uh, those that are of a, a legal nature, uh, you know, uh, a public health oriented nature, and uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, interventions. Um, uh, Pratap, um, can you give us a short brief on, on, on your take on some of the responses that you have seen? Um, sure. Um, so again, uh, thank you for having me on this panel. This is a great opportunity and uh, to be on the same panel as Chris and Steve and you. It's, it's an honor, thank you. Um, so um, uh, the Kenyan response uh, has been really interesting for me in various, uh, at various levels. Uh, so at some times I am amazed at what is um, happening and what's possible. At the same time, at some time I'm really dismayed at um, uh, some of the uh, uh, decisions that have been taken. So very early on, for example, um, so before uh, there was even a first case uh, officially in, um, in Kenya, I was passing through a town uh, close to Nairobi and in um, uh, Kajiado County, the neighboring county. And uh, it's a busy area with a big market. And what I was seeing that every 20 meters uh, was a hand washing station. There was a tank of water, there was soap, uh, and it was clearly uh, well labeled, very visible, and everybody was using it. And this was in um, uh, late March. And to see that level of public response, um, at an individual level uh, and uh, coordinated by the um, uh, regional government was inspiring. Um, so hand washing, as we all know, has been such a big challenge for uh, most developing countries to try and instill among um, its populations. Uh, and people say that, you know, the statistics are that half or more than uh, large numbers of the population don't have access to hand washing at their homes. And to see this level of um, uh, early uh, change happening in uh, busy bustling town centers was truly amazing. Uh, and since then, there's been a host of other strategies, like you mentioned, um, uh, Ben, there's been um, uh, the uh, curfew between 7 p.m. from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, there's been uh, a lockdown of certain counties, so you can't get into and out of Nairobi and uh, some of the coastal counties where you're seeing cases. Uh, and there's been quarantining in place of people who have been uh, in contact with um, uh, with uh, suspect or confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases. Now that has been uh, some of the challenging parts, I think, of the uh, response because uh, from the beginning, uh, it's been the case, like in many other places and other countries as well, that the person who's quarantined bears the cost of being quarantined. And this has led to some amazing, you know, headline making stories of people escaping quarantine, climbing over walls, going back into the community, sitting in a bar and drinking and being caught over there, uh, having escaped quarantine. Uh, it's only yesterday uh, that this policy has changed that uh, now the government is going to bear the cost of quarantining people and um, encouraging people to come forward for testing. Because that was a big uh, challenge early on is that people don't uh, come forward for quarantine uh, for testing because if you do get tested and get positive, you're going to be put into this uh, whole um, sometimes pleasant, sometimes not very pleasant, and you're supposed to be bearing the cost of um, all these quarantining efforts. So that's been, um, I think, um, a major challenge with uh, uh, the response in Kenya uh, because people were not encouraged to come forward for testing. It's only changing now. And uh, that's a link to the testing as well now. Um, so uh, as we have seen, the number of, of cases here in Kenya and um, East Africa is not very high. So right now the confirmed cases are about 500. Um, but the deaths are about 26 um, as of today. 
And based on the international uh, numbers and understanding that we have, we expect about 8,000 cases uh, to have resulted in the 26 deaths that have, um, have been recorded so far. So we know that we don't have enough data about um, the number of cases. Testing is really inadequate. The um, numbers of tests uh, conducted, the response rate, uh, the response times. These are all uh, been. These have all been challenges. And so I think I'd like to echo uh, Chris's point that at an individual level, you know, Kenyans have been amazing. It, it's uh, people, you know, fathers have gotten to know their children much more because uh, of this. Um, uh, uh, isolation at home, family dynamics have changed, people have gotten to online schooling, participating in their children's education. These are all huge societal changes that I think people have uh, embraced in a very short period. Uh, but um, uh, behavioral change at um, policy level or at leadership, that's been uh, some of the things that we might or should talk about. It's not just behavior change at an individual level, which I think has been amazing, um, uh, but we should also uh, talk about behavior change at people making some of these largest, uh, larger decisions. Ben, I think you're muted. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, <laughs> sometimes it becomes a challenge remembering between the mute and the unmute. Okay, so <laughs> thank you for pointing that out and thank you for sharing your sentiments. It seems that, uh, you know, um, what is happening here and um, what is happening in, uh, in, in, in New York in particular uh, with regards to, to, um, to prevention strategies seem to be following pretty much what is uh, what is part of the global uh, uh, script. Uh, variations in terms of restrictions in movement, um, issues to do with uh, public information or public health messaging. Uh, Steve, I don't know if uh, this summary is more or less correct or if you've seen some unusual ways um, in terms of trying to come to, to terms or to address this pandemic. Well, thank you, Ben. And it's uh, great to be uh, on this web uh, cast with uh, my colleagues and friends. Um, just, just a couple of comments, uh, just for people who uh, may be less aware of US geography. I live in Philadelphia, which is about an hour south of, of New York City. And uh, the profile of what's going on in terms of the incidence of COVID-19 is so dramatically different that it's astonishing. Uh, given simu similar demographics, not quite the same population densities, uh, uh, but still a very heavy reliance on public transportation and the like, uh, we have not experienced the same uh, phenomenon as New York or to, to the same degree. And as uh, uh, Chris was saying, um, the, the U.S. federalist system where every state governor has a huge authority uh, is playing out in some interesting ways. We locked down very, very early. Our governor was very proactive uh, and uh, people are, have been quite compliant. Uh, uh, all that said, what I'm what I find fascinating is the near universal reaction of populations to uh, mandates by their governments to shut down, uh, to lock down. Uh, and there's, there's been a fair amount of consistency across the world. <clears throat> what I am mostly concerned about, though, is how long that will endure given the growing economic hardship that many societies are, are confronting. Uh, there will be an impatience, uh, which, which will be manageable by communication, some of the things we'll talk about today and in, and in this program. Uh, uh, but in, at the end of the day, uh, the necessity of putting food on the table, having an income, uh, is, is, uh, is going to uh, uh, really shadow, or put a shadow on this issue of compliance. 
So where, where we have to be, I think, very alert is that this is not simply an upfront message. Uh, it is going to require continual reinforcement. Uh, and in different societies where there is different level of communication, different levels of access to, uh, to smartphones, different levels of access to the internet, different levels of access to media, uh, we're going to find uh, 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 we, we may well begin to see things fracture um, in terms of, of response. So I think that's one of the one of the things we really have to develop in this in this course. The minute the minute people start stop listening is when we have we start having a a, a very big problem. So I'll I'll close there and I'll be happy to chime in later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that overview. Questions are coming in thick and fast. So in order to try and um uh, and be on top of them. So let me just pick out a few uh, and then uh, we can take it up from there. So I have uh, Henry Omtata who asks, um, uh, how come the virus uh, similar like COVID-19, the SARS group that occurred in China and the Saudi Arabia one, which was called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, uh, you know, um, was easily managed and controlled pretty fast as compared to the current uh, COVID-19. Uh, Chris, you want to take a stab at that or I do? <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm not a virologist, but uh, if you look at the, the epidemiology curve for those other coronaviruses, uh, it's quite different. And so they, they behave differently in terms of how contagious they are and you know, the number of people that can be infected easily from a person who's infected and how deadly they are. If you look at the MERS, which is, uh, is one of the more deadly viruses, uh, it has uh, something like a 30% death rate uh, from MERS, but is relatively difficult to get uh, from another person. So, so I can only imagine speaking as a non-virologist that the, those two elements are contributing to the fact that those other coronaviruses didn't spread as quickly and they weren't as deadly as the current uh, coronavirus, the SARS COVID-19. The other thing is, is that we still have a lot to learn about this virus. The way it's infecting people, the way it's behaving after it's infected people, the way people are responding in terms of their um, you know, in terms of the symptoms that they're showing, it's, we just still, I still feel we don't know enough about this virus, despite the fact that it's been around for five, six months and infected three and a half million people, as you said, Ben. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers Henry's question, but I'll also combine it with, uh, with Carol's question, who asked uh, about the differentiator between SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. Um, but before answering about the differentiator, let me tell you the similarities. Both, all three of them uh, belong to a family that uh, in virology is known as uh, beta coronaviruses. Okay, so they belong to that one family. And the other thing that is similar with, uh, uh, with them is that uh, beyond being coronaviruses, obviously, is that their origin is, uh, is primarily in bats. Remember, I started at the beginning by saying that uh, coronaviruses are quite ubiquitous. You can find them across a wide range of mammals and across a wide range of geographies. Most of the times, they don't uh, um, cause very severe illnesses. And so, you know, they're sort of uh, left to the periphery of study. But occasionally, you do have those that uh, cause severe illnesses, such as uh, uh, SARS and MERS. Now, uh, Although they belong to the same family, uh, the way in which they uh, attack individuals, the way in which they move, and the severity of infection that they cause differs. And this is probably why, uh, in terms of management, um, the way that then you get a response to whatever public health uh, uh, interventions or other health promotion interventions that you put in uh, differs, okay? Now, I will add, uh, I will ask one, one question, you know, uh, that seems to be a theme from around the, 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 the various questions that we have on the board there. Um, so we have these interventions and we have these messages that have been put out there. 
The question is, have they stimulated the desired behavior, okay, in individuals uh, and in communities? Um, if they have, why do you think they have been successful or in those areas that you think they have, they have been successful? And if they haven't, uh, why haven't they been successful? Um, uh, who would like to go first on that one? Um, maybe uh, Steve? Sure, Th thank you. Uh, you know, it, the, the academics and the sociologists haven't quite caught up with this um, mon uh, documenting the level of compliance. Uh, I think it, it is strongest, or the res a positive response to the communication message is strongest where people feel they have the, the greatest vulnerability or stake in things. So those communities that are multi-generational, tight-knit, uh, where there are numerous households, uh, where grandparents live alongside uh, 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 their, great, their grandchildren or great-grandchildren, I think there's uh, much further, uh, much more sensitivity to the message and a higher degree of compliance uh, and there is a reinforcement from household to household, from neighborhood to neighborhood, um, where uh, people get the message. Uh, the mere shutting down of certain businesses, uh, certain types of businesses, r retail, uh, 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 restaurants, uh, hotels, livery services, and especially things like schools, these are very powerful messages. Uh, so even if you are not doing public health promotion, uh, this things have affected people's lives in such a uh, profound and personal way that uh, they continuously reinforce uh, 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 the situation. So I, I think uh, it's a combination of vulnerability by example, by social pressure, and just the reality that things are different. Uh, we get up day after day, uh, and each day is uh, uh, no different than the day before. Uh, it's it, a cultural reference in the United States is the movie called Groundhog Day. Uh, Groundhog Day is uh, February 2nd in the United States. I won't go into that history, but a movie with the actor Bill Murray was made some years ago where he wakes up every day uh, and uh, it's always Groundhog Day, day after day after day. And that, the similarity of routine from one day to the next in and of itself is a reinforcement of um, of what's going of what's going on we we uh, go to bed we wake up in the morning pretty much with similar thoughts and our our days are not going to be much different unless we're first responders or in providing essential services um, so things don't change Chris, yeah, thank, I, you, if, thank if, if Chris has something to say you're on mute Chris Oh no, I, I, I really appreciate that, that answer and the question. Um, you know, I think we are, as, as many of you know, running a course together. Uh, Dr. Ben and I are, are co-facilitating a course with Strathmore and NYU that's ongoing. And, uh, and it's really precisely addressing this issue. And all I would add at this moment is that it's incredibly complex why one community might respond to the message strategies in order to get them to behave in a way to protect themselves and their families and their community and why others might be resistant. And that complexity has to do with the economic factors and the policy factors, there are cultural and behavioral factors, there are geographic factors, there are a lot of different parts to that equation. And I think without having a sense of how those factors work to influence the outcome that you're looking for and how they also influence one another. So how does the economics influence the policy and vice versa and the culture and, and the behavior? And so I think that, that uh, it's enormously complex why there are some groups that are particularly resistant 
to messaging strategy, strategies that we know are going to help them, we know that are going to protect them. And I saw an earlier question that said, you know, if we don't know that much about, if we don't know enough about this disease, how can we possibly work to prevent it? Well, we know that, that what we do know is that this, this strategy of staying apart from one another, of wearing masks, of, of behaving in a way that would protect us in our communities is, the, is really the most effective tool that we have right now in the absence of a vaccine and the absence of a therapy and the absence of really testing, as Pratap said, very rigorously so that we know who's been exposed and who's had the disease and then following up on those, on those uh, exposures. So all we have is this uh, concept of, of being able to do uh, this physical distancing, wearing masks and behavior change at the moment. Um, and we need to try to develop strategies together. Now, it's not coming from the US, it's not gonna come from Nairobi, it's, it's just it's gonna be something that we build together uh, to be able to develop strategies for communities that are a little bit more resistant to the messages that will help protect them. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for, for that, Chris. And, and you know, sort of to give a little bit of a context and to, to marry with some of the questions that we have here. For example, uh, Daniel on the forum is asking around uh, community radio and uh, whether it is an avenue that has been uh, explored or can be exploited further given um, um, its previous positive effects. Um, uh, we have a related question from uh, Carol, um, who's uh, uh, trying to relate that to non-compliance, say, for example, to sanitizers and masks. And to, um, I think, uh, if I scroll quickly down here, I see a question from uh, Wausi Walia um, on the thin line between persuasion, coercion, and the temptation to use force to get con societies to change behavior. So uh, I, I think for me, you know, in the local context, uh, this can give some ideas as to as to why we are having challenges with the uh, uh, with the behavior change. Okay, so um, communication and how you factor in your strategies, if 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 I may 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 add on the local context, needs to 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 bear in mind the the realities on the ground. And so the question here is whether the intervention, so the communication message as it is structured, um, is being done from a top down perspective or a bottom-up perspective and how people perceive these kinds of things. So when it comes down as a directive or as an edict, you generally tend to expect people to have a little bit of a pushback uh, and their acceptance of that is going to be dependent on the kind of trust relationship that has been built between the one in power and the one below. So this is one issue uh, that, that we have been, uh, one can be able to sort of like uh, link towards that. Um, the other thing would be uh, when you structure an intervention or a message, uh, as I mentioned, in a, in a, in a punitive sense, and uh, somebody else has mentioned on the, on the forum here around uh, uh, the positive move that has now been made uh, toward uh, the government paying for, uh, uh, for quarantine. Um, part of what uh, Dr. Pratap mentioned earlier, people not, not coming forward, was precisely because of that. Um, why would I come forward if uh, by coming forward for mass testing, and somebody else has asked about it here, by coming forward for mass testing or by volunteering that uh, I probably have a sick person at home, it is going to make me incur further costs because by taking this person to, to hospital, by taking them or having ourselves quarantined, um, it is going to cost us money, money that has to come from our pocket. And remember that two thirds, uh, more than two thirds of our population, in fact, some estimated uh, to be closer to, to 80, 81%, 90% in other texts, uh, work in, 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 in informal or unstructured settings. And so this is money that they don't have, okay? So some of these can give ideas around the, 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 uh, the reasons why some of the strategies or, or some of the communication messages that we have uh, we have tried to put out there uh, do not work. Now, um, if I may then ask uh, again, um, you know, um, 
based on these experiences, um, how do you think we could be able to, to, to structure our, our messages and interventions better um, in order for us to be able to achieve the desired change? Um, Pratap, maybe I could, I could start with you on that one. Um, thanks, Ben. I, I think it'll be worth making the point. Uh, I know it's not, you know, um, not always good form to try and get back to slides and use it as a crutch. Um, but I'd like to just uh, go through a couple of slides that will try and make a point uh, uh, quite clear about what we need to be doing next. Um, okay. So, How many minutes do I allow you for this? Five? I have a raft of than, questions that I want five. to do from the let's, participants. Let's, okay, great. Excellent. Let's three go minutes. ahead. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, let's just look at a couple of slides and recent data from uh, the London School of uh, Hygiene. Um, and this is really important. This is uh, very um, recent analysis and data. Is that because of the measures that have been taken around um, uh, social distancing and closing down of uh, public gatherings and, and so on so far in, in Kenya in particular, We've been able to push the peak of this epidemic uh, a little bit. And now uh, we are talking about reopening. So restaurants are being reopened right now. People are uh, almost returning back to life in Kibera and many of the um, um, uh, densely populated areas. But we must remember that uh, it's likely that we have pushed the peak of this epidemic down two or three months. So we are estimating that the peak of this uh, of the deaths and of the cases is going to be around August, September. And so it's uh, going to be um, counterproductive to try and uh, stop these measures um, now and start opening up, uh, opening up society. Uh, and there's a similar study from uh, the Imperial College saying that line is pretty much today. And if we relax interventions, we are going to start increasing the number of uh, daily infections and so on. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is Johns Hopkins data on uh, built on you know Ebola uh, learnings about what happens when you shut down health systems and the number of deaths that you're trying that you're likely to get from other conditions and in this case maternal and um, child mortality. And we're likely to have large amounts of child and maternal mortality because our uh, health system is going to, might be over, overwhelmed by COVID and corona cases over the next few months. And so um, the response right now, like Rachel, as somebody pointed out in the, um, in the chat, is that people aren't uh, wearing masks and socially distancing right now. It's because we haven't given that messaging around the um, the timing of this epidemic and when the likely deaths are going to happen. We're not seeing so many deaths right now, possibly because the densely populated areas in, uh, in Nairobi, for example, are mainly younger populations and we don't have the older populations that are likely to be more susceptible to coronavirus. But it doesn't mean that uh, we're not going to see these deaths as the infection spreads. So it's so the messaging around this has to be very consistent to say this is a longer term um, uh, term issue and we need to be rewarding people for good behavior. So all the stuff that we have seen before, people staying at home, distancing, businesses closing their offices, all these needs to be recognized and rewarded in some way. And that is something that we aren't seeing enough of, I feel, is the support for individual behavior change. In the beginning, people were willing to stay at home, people are willing to uh, distance themselves, but the pain starts to come. Um, so if we see food distribution efforts being thwarted uh, or not being uh, supported enough, it is likely to result in a rebellion against what the government is dictating. And so we probably should take you know, the lessons from uh, what we know about behavior change communication about rewarding positive responses uh, supporting these uh, behavior change in many other ways, like uh, supporting uh, access to food, supporting access to incomes, and so on. And that is something that will really be uh, beneficial for the medium to longer term.
Okay. So uh, that's, perhaps that's it. Okay. Yes. That's okay. It. Okay. Good. I, I'll come back. I'll come back to you um, because um, there, there there was a question um, that was specifically asking the one on community radio. I've just remembered um, that we didn't quite effectively answer it, but at the same time, um, there are a number of questions that are looking at. Uh, innovations that, um, that, that we can be able to latch onto um, in terms of uh, uh, if we are to have a much greater assurance that what is communicated actually uh, gets to the right audience and it actually leads to the desired behavior. Um, uh, some of the questions that I'm seeing on the forum actually allude to this, more specifically the one on, 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 uh, on um, on community radio, uh, but then there, there has also been a couple of questions. I can pick out Hassan here, I can pick out Elizabeth, where we are alluding to the fact that some of the messaging around uh, uh, COVID and how it has been presented has actually led to stigmatization of those who have been infected or otherwise affected. So yes, um, how, what innovations can we latch onto if we are to have, to make sure that uh, uh, the right information gets to the right audience and therefore has the, 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 the right effect. Uh, Chris, can I start with you? On uh, yeah, I think that, um, and really thank you for that question because I think that's at the heart of, of what we ought to be thinking about uh, collectively in public health because I think that, um, that we have to have the ability to try new ways of addressing the complexity of the response. Because if we try to keep using the old tools that are, as you said earlier, Ben, these top-down communication tools and strategies, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to have the effect that we want and that the innovation is likely to be coming from communities, from people who are in the, in the middle of it. And, and those innovations are going to be around, how do we track who is at risk? How are we going to be able to uh, isolate people so that they don't infect other people? Those types of more management operational types of innovations. Uh, I think we're going to come up with a lot of new and innovative strategies for how to create messages that appeal to people, as Steve said, on an emotional level. How are, they, how are we going to be able to have them uh, first of all, trust the government and trust the message they're getting on how to behave in order to protect themselves. But when the pandemic starts to uh, ebb, uh, we're going to have to have an equal set of innovations to convince people to go back to work, to go back to restaurants, to go back to schools, to get back on public transportation. So I think that that uh, we, we really are going to be developing a whole, and then finally, as you say, there are going to be delivery innovations, which I think Pratap will be able to uh, address uh, in terms of how we're going to be delivering those messages through radio, through television, through internet and other ways. Uh, so there's a whole host of really good thinking that has to come together around this. And, it's, and as I said at the beginning, it's, it's just not going to come from uh, the, the the top down or maybe even the traditional places where we've seen innovation, it's gonna, it's gonna come from communities and from individuals and it's gonna come from all of you that are in the audience today uh, because you all are responsible for developing strategies to protect your employees, to protect your constituents, to protect your families, to protect your patients. Uh, and so I really think that, that if we can provide some space uh, and some a little bit of structure that Pratap will help guide us through. Uh, I think we'll end up with some pretty interesting innovations to uh, address this curve. Over to you. Thank you, thank you for that, Steve. Any 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 thoughts before I get back to Pratap? Well, on on the question of of stigmatization, which I think is a, a very important one. Of course, we all know how how culturally uh, different that can be, um, uh, even within even within a country. Uh, different groups are are going to react to to disease in different ways, and we've we've known this for thousands of years. Uh, 
well, I think what is occurring very quickly in the most affected places of the United States, and this is quite palpable, um, is that the uh, uh, just about everyone now uh, it doesn't matter where you live, but if you're if you're in the uh, northeast corridor of the United States, everyone knows someone or many many people who have been infected or who have succumbed to the disease. Uh, so there's been a kind of dilution of of this stig stigmatization effect. And, uh, and unlike many diseases in the past, uh, uh, people are not being held responsible for having contracted, uh, uh, become positive. Uh, so we don't, we don't have that element uh, of it. But I think, I think it is something that uh, policymakers are going to have to be sensitive to, and it's uh, it's a very important part of the educational message uh, that gets out there. That uh, in men, in much the same way that we should not feel stigmatized by having the common cold or the flu, uh, even though this is a different disease, uh, we we should not feel stigmatized uh, by this, and that's something we're going to have to to drive. The, the, the other thing that's unusual about this is historically when there have been quarantines, uh, we've quarantined the ill. Um, here, we've quarantined humanity. Uh, uh, and I, I think, uh, Chris, you, you're probably more of a historian of this than I am, but uh, uh, we, we, don't really, we don't really have a good ledger uh, of what reaction is over time to entire societies being quarantined uh, and how that affects the perception of a disease or the personal responsibility for a disease. Um, so I don't know if that answers the stigma to question, stigmatization question uh, that was being asked, but that's my take on it. Okay. Uh, Pratap, anything on uh, some of the, the innovations um, you know, that we can latch on to if we are to have a, <clears throat> a much better uh, uh, response. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to give any specific um, um, examples, but I think what I want to make is a, a point that there are different aspects to the problem, right? So there are, um, there's a, different people are facing different types of problems, whether it's uh, trying to get out and um, uh, get food, get employment, uh, get money, or uh, get my elderly relative taken care of, or uh, be able to um, effectively self-isolate or homeschool. So there's a huge variety of problems uh, that, um, uh, that are there at this point uh, that are coming uh, to the fore. And it's um, uh, not going to be, um, productive unless we take a systematic approach to how we um, encourage and manage innovation. And that is uh, um, something that we have been talking about in um, uh, a global health innovation management program or other programs that we run is that we have to systematically tackle innovation in global health. And global health and innovation has really not been um, going forward at a good speed, partly because it is a very complex area and people say there isn't the money. I mean, where are these innovations going to be paid for? But that is uh, one of the fundamental challenges of how, how are we going to get innovation um, uh, into global health and adopted and um, uh, embedded into global health practice. So um, uh, while we talk about you know, innovations for, uh, say, detection, testing, quarantining, uh, contact tracing, treatment, and so on, I would say we need to uh, we have a heads up, we have already done a lot of work around health system support with innovative approaches, whether it's telemedicine to some extent, whether it's you know, uh, novel ways to um, uh, support uh, data collection, documentation, and so on. We have done, the global health community has made significant advances in small pockets. And so this is probably a time where some of these innovations that we already understand uh, can be uh, put into place um, much more effectively because there is a welcoming environment for that. 
Um, but, uh, and the last point I'd like to make is about that environment for innovation. And so it's going to be together. We have to come together. It has to be a diverse group. It has to be people with different skills and it has to come, like Chris said, from uh, the bottom up. We have to have health professionals working with community leaders, with communication experts, with radio agents, with um, um, uh, speakers, with um, uh, other uh, community uh, representatives of vulnerable, vulnerable people, of disabled uh, people. There, this has to be a, a collective effort and I think Okay, it seems I have uh, temporarily lost uh, Pratap. Hopefully, he will be able to to come back in. But um, if I if I can pick up on his drift, um, the issue is that we must look at innovation uh, from many areas, from uh, a lot of sources, not just the traditional sources, but also the the non traditional sources. Um, looking at innovations even from those people who are in the front line um of, of of caring for this disease or uh helping to work in, in in terms of its prevention or trying to act in many many small ways um and creating an environment that allows us to mop up these innovations and then rapidly bring them up to scale because uh as uh, i believe uh, it is uh Wairimo, if my uh, uh the, the chat is, uh, is is correct is saying this is a reality that we now seems like we have to to live with now, in terms of uh, structuring the, the communications, um, I could probably not give any one best way, but I could leave maybe share some sort of uh, three general or very broad uh, 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 principles. Number one is that we need to think through the continuum of the, of the disease or of the infection. And I believe Chris has sort of like mentioned this, you know, um, right now we are uh, thinking through the phase of, uh, of the outbreak, okay? Um, some are beginning now to open up, okay? So they've gone beyond the hump and now uh, um, infection rates are becoming lower. There's some degree of stability. Uh, that in itself is going to bring up certain uh, challenges. When we look at the different individuals, um, there are many, by the way, do get mild or asymptomatic um, uh, disease and actually you don't get to see them. But then you also have those who end up having some kind of uh, requiring some kind of rehabilitation or hospitalized care. And their needs in terms of communication and for those who care for them is going to be different. So principle number one, think through the entire continuum. The second one is different messages for different audiences and addressed towards different goals. That is very, very key. The kind of messaging that we are going to, to need to uh, uh, deliver, say, for example, for those on the front line, as uh, somebody asks on the question, needs to be very specific and very targeted to them. Um, for a behavior change communication strategy, the word uh, a general audience does not apply because uh, most of us, as you, as, as you may well know, um, we are using social media, um, there is the use of the newspapers and the internet, but not everybody has access to those things. And particularly if we speak uh, from within our context uh, uh, down here, um, not everybody can be able to, 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 to read or write or access data uh, in the way that we do. So the messages need to be packaged, bearing in mind uh, 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 these different audiences. And of course, number three then becomes the engagement of, of, of those beneficiaries, particularly in terms of trying to understand uh, where they're coming from and what exactly would enable them towards picking up the, 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 the right ideas. And as somebody has mentioned here on, uh, no, I think two or three people have mentioned here on the chat room, um, my, if my problems right at the moment are uh, elsewhere, then I'm not gonna focus on, uh, it's about the next meal I'm going to have. I'm not gonna focus on buying sanitizer. And so we have to sort of like balance how to meet these needs and get it to that space, okay? Now, um, we are getting to uh, the end zone of our conversation. I wish we had more time, but um, I would want to sort of like uh, maybe finish off with uh, two questions. Um, one was from uh, 
Uh, Beatrice, who says, uh, how can we maintain a balance between the attention that is being given to, uh, uh, to COVID and to what needs to be given to other uh, diseases? I believe the WHO has also been constantly reminding us, you know, let's not forget TB, let's not forget malaria, let's not forget HIV, let's not forget all these other problems that we have. And then closely related to that is Wairimu's point that uh, the reality is that we now have to, to live with this. And, and what kind of messaging uh, um, uh, can we put uh, in place or how can we structure uh, our messaging and our interactions? Um, I leave this open to any of my panel who's willing to, to answer very quickly to, to any of those two questions. Ben, I, I'd like to jump in on this one. Um, Interestingly, you you did you did bring up a very bi um, important issue, and that is right now COVID nineteen is getting all the attention. Uh, and you asked um, uh, about uh, TB, malaria, HIV. Interestingly, you chose all other communicable diseases. What we haven't talked about yet is what the impact of of COVID nineteen is going to be on the care of, of non-communicable diseases, uh, chronic diseases, because when we survey what's going on in South Asia, in Africa, in what, just about everywhere in the world, uh, the health systems have been uh, reoriented towards dealing with COVID-19 and routine things like um, uh, 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 blood pressure, medication and care, care of diabetics, uh, intervention in cancers, diseases, uh, a lot of these things are being put on hold. And we know the morbid consequences of delaying care. Uh, uh, so one of the things, in much the same way that the world was not prepared for this pandemic, uh, we have to, as, even as we're resolving this COVID-19, have to be thinking about what the surge in the demand for care is going to be as COVID-19 resolves. That may be one of the most difficult transitions that we're going to have to make. And I don't think enough attention is being paid, paid to that um, uh, at national levels or local levels, or certainly not a global level. So we need to be very mindful of that. I have a, a couple of thoughts also, Ben, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and I'll do it very quickly because I know we're almost out of time. But we, uh, at the risk of being provocative, I'm not confident that the current global health architecture will be able to support the attention on multiple diseases in the middle of the pandemic or even post-pandemic. And I think that if we are going to successfully respond to the myriad challenges that are both infectious disease and non-communicable diseases, as Steve said, and of course the mental health challenges that are inevitably gonna come from this. I believe we need to really effectively engage communities because the community response and the community uh, development of tools to be able to engage in surveillance and response and management and behavior change, I think that is a way to inoculate us as a society against multiple threats. If we're gonna rely on WHO and our governments and the, the global health architecture, they've already proven to us that they don't, they're not up to the task, that the response has got to come from our communities, from us. And they can help support yeah. us, maybe we'll get money, but uh, I think this is, uh, is where I see the future going. And that's mainly what I'd like to say as well. It is going to be a local, um, a locally led or should be a locally led response. And the only point I'd like to leave at is, uh, yeah, even with Strathmore University and the medical center there, we are already implementing a telemedicine intervention that allows for diabetics and other people who can't come to the clinic physically to start accessing care, uh, get insurance buy-in to be able to deliver these consultations at very short notice. So these are all interventions that I, I think are going to be led by the need, the demand, and the community response uh, to the situation. And uh, the more we can do around ourselves uh, in Kenya, uh, the better we're going to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, in, in, in summarizing or in closing, what I can say is that one of the things that has become very real for me with uh, um, 
this pandemic is this. Um, it has really brought back home the centrality of, 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 of public health in the sense that, uh, you know, health, um, it has brought back uh, to us the reality that health is a function of what we do as individuals, what happens within our societies or communities, uh, the interaction with our physical environment, and then with all the other socioeconomic and cultural uh, uh, things that we, uh, we need to address. Um, it is not something where, um, as we have over the years, uh, and partly because of the medicalization of health, um, we have focused more and more and more on institutions. In fact, part of the panic as to whether our institutions can uh, take care of uh, what is ensuing from this uh, pandemic is exactly because of that. That we have learned to equate uh, uh, healthcare with the availability and accessibility of hospitals. And in a sense, therefore, abrogated our roles as individuals uh, or as members of communities and what we are doing with regards to the environment in terms of making sure um, that that happens. Now, if we are able to bring back uh, this message that it is a, health is an all-in affair, um, then we could be able to uh, put in place uh, enough attention on the technologies and innovations that can help us to get uh, uh, the most you know, uh, cost-efficient uh, uh, ways of dealing um, with disease, whether we're talking about uh, health promotion or prevention or whatever. But even more importantly, uh, and building on, uh, on, on, on what uh, Chris and Steve and, uh, and, and Pratap have shared, um, looking for that most cost-efficient site of care. If this is really going to be our new normal, we have definitely have to find that. Whether that be the home, that be the communities, that be the local dispensary, um, all the health center. And that way, we will be able to allow our hospitals or our institutions of care to actually focus on the more uh, advanced levels of care. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the panel, thank you so much. We have run out of time. I must apologize if uh, we have not tackled specifically some of the questions that you have put in or have bundled them uh, um, with others. But we do have another session next week uh, where we will be tackling uh, stories from the front line um, with regards to uh, experiences of institutions, uh, various policy groups, uh, fast responders, and so on to the management of the, of the pandemic. And we will try to retain some of the questions that uh, have not, uh, we've not been able to cover in this session to answer then. So once again, thank you very much panelists. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve. Thank you, Pratap. Uh, and thank you all our participants for your engagement and the questions that you have, uh, uh, you have put before us that have allowed us to actually uh, uh, have a very, very meaningful discussion. Thank you once again. Do have a good evening or a good day, depending on where you are in this part of the world. Thank you, Ben.